Um, I'm going to talk quite a lot about the work that um, uh, I carried out with my colleagues when I was Chief Executive of the Wildlife Trust, but these are my own views. So why did we start? We, we were one of the first organisations in Gloucestershire to use the Badger vaccine. And there are some really good practical reasons for this. Uh, we wanted to find out how to do it. We had the benefit of the Woodchester team, who are incredibly supportive and gave us lots of advice. But we really wanted to see how we could use Badger vaccination on our own nature reserves, and more importantly, make the information publicly available at the small scale. We are right down at the bottom end from the Badger vaccine deployment program. We are, our nature reserves all lay outside of that, so that's why we wanted to do it for ourselves. Um, reminding ourselves also that this is about cattle, and the Wildlife Trust, like many conservation organizations, use cattle in its day-to-day uh, -day work. We'd had bovine TB breakdowns uh, on our sites. Our graziers had suffered from the disease, so it was very real to us. The Wildlife Trusts uh, are significant landowners, so is the National Trust. So this whole business of bovine TB is not about um, a very narrow view. It's a very practical experience. 20 farms managed by the Wildlife Trust, one by the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust. In the foreword to the TB strategy for England, this rather reassuring statement that bovine TB management had to take account of whilst maintaining biodiversity. If you're a wildlife trust, that's your business. So what we did was look at the land that we had under management and try and see where a restricted deployment of the vaccine would make sense. Obviously, we wanted badgers, we wanted grassland, and in Gloucestershire, a recent history of bovine TB was not difficult because the county suffers from it very significantly. We winnowed it down from our local record centre, and we came up with two groups of reserves that looked practicable. Um, a clump of reserves in the Stroud Valleys, and then the farm that the Trust manages up at Greystones. And that's a small dairy farm of the old scale. It would not function as a modern commercial farm, but nevertheless, it is run as a farm unit. Uh, the, what wildlife trusts and other conservation bodies of this sort have in common with the farming community is livestock. You can't manage grasslands well without beasts, and very often it's cattle. And those were the trust cattle last year. Healthy animals make all the difference. And indeed, getting grazing right is critical for maintaining biodiversity. This is the Daneway Banks Nature Reserve, where the Trust successfully, with butterfly conservation, reintroduced the large blue butterfly. But that insect requires a very bizarre uh, pattern for its life cycle. It requires short grass in places. So the Trust had there worked with a grazier. It now uses um, borrowed sheep and ponies. So grazing is something that is not taken lightly. This whole thing of land management, land expertise, is central to the way that conservation bodies operate. Uh, the Stroud Valley's nature reserve, this is Pete Bradshaw, who's here today, who knows a lot about the, the sharp end or the muddy end of uh, badger conservation. They are classic old-time nature reserves. They're the small, difficult to get at bits of land with no water supply that nobody else could make money from. So they ended up keeping their nature, and that's why they become nature reserves. That's my very crude analysis of conservation theory for you. But it does make it very difficult for accessibility. And on this site, Pete's carrying in a pelly case with vaccine. But when you see him carrying two badger cages across several fields, it is a huge challenge. So these sites were expensive and much more difficult to operate than conventional farmland. Uh, conversely, our, Daneway Bank, uh, sorry, our Greystones Farm Nature Reserve at the time uh, that's had people busy there for about 6,000 years. It's probably the oldest farm in the whole country. It's got a, a Neolithic causewayed enclosure, which the archaeologists get very excited about, although nobody knows what that means. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it is a flat site, and it's more conventional farmland. So Land Rover access, four-wheel drive access, makes the whole site much easier to operate. We started looking in 2010 at what this means, and this is a process that's still relevant, and Gavin's um, uh, description was incredibly helpful of the detail, what, what you need to go through if you're kind of trying to do this for yourself. Lots of equipment to try and understand. You need staff if you're going to do it in-house. 
Uh, but I think one of the keys, actually, and probably a, a step that's been overlooked, is the veterinary profession is really important in this whole issue of controlling bovine TB and TB strategy. And locating a vet who's prepared to do the professional part of acquiring and managing uh, Badger BCG stocks is absolutely critical. You have to have that. Otherwise, you can't proceed with a, with a program if you're doing it in-house. So how do we get on? Well, the, the, these two sites were then broken down. All the costs were kept meticulously. The trust uh, finance department looked at the numbers, so they weren't made up. These are real numbers using conventional auditing process with de depreciation of the capital equipment plus the usual revenue costs. Very boring, but actually the two numbers came out that, not surprisingly, the difficult to get to sites were more expensive than, than the Land Roverable site at Greystones Farm. But I think this is valid. This was the whole object of the test. What does it mean? If you're working on small sites, they're more difficult to get to, they're more expensive. Um, in terms of deployments, last year was awful. It was really wet. It, was, it took more time. It was more miserable for badgers and the people vaccinating badgers. Uh, a slightly larger area of land was included. Badger count was about the same. So the first year's experience, this is published, by the way, on the Trust website, Wildlife Trust's website, and my own website, if you want to read the first year write-up and the second year write-up. So these are valid trials at this scale, and this was just trying to contribute. Not scientific, practical stuff. And again, this year, a much drier year, an extra set has been included on private land adjacent to one of the nature reserves, similar kind of experience. So I think those figures are valid, and I'll come back to cost in a minute. The Wildlife Trust are not the only players, of course. The Badger Trust and Badger Groups have been very busy, and over the three years since uh, lay vaccination has been possible, you can see that capacity and experience has been developed very impressively as, um, as a stakeholder group. Uh, this is absolutely up to date. You don't get much sharper than that. And still badgers are being vaccinated, as Gavin said. So there are still figures to be confirmed. But thank you to Simon uh, for supplying those figures to me. In terms of where the wildlife trusts are, this has now been scaled up from the work in Gloucestershire to something much more um, significant. And other trusts are also using vaccination on land. A group of trusts are ready to vaccinate. Dorset is about to vaccinate, or maybe vaccinating at the moment. And there are those trusts that are thinking about whether or not they should take this forward. In terms of numbers, probably this isn't about a, uh, to prove anything in terms of the no number of badgers. It's much more about the experience, the knowledge transfer, as Gavin mentioned. More and more people are getting experience of working with this technique, finding out how to do it, what it means, and how you integrate it into your normal work plan. Um, Pete and, uh, and uh, John are here. They did a day's work after they got up at 4 o'clock and went badger vaccinating. If you're running a commercial business, you have to really take this on board, and that's what we really wanted to know. Could this be taken forward by the farming community? It's not just a luxury that can be bolted on. This had to be integrated into proper land management, in my view. This is a long-term problem. This isn't a quick, quick fix at all. In terms of... Uh, of the number of organizations involved looking at this map, and Gavin's was better because it had the counties on it, most of the counties in the red and the amber area now have practical knowledge at the tiny scale of badger vaccination. <coughs> Groups have been using the vaccine in the field, and that will increase. So there is capacity now for something to start to be significant. How do you go about actually learning this whole skill? Well, you've got three options as a landowner. You can do it with your own staff, you can bring in contractors and there are specialists in the field, or you can use volunteers alongside those. Um, the guy on the right is Steve Peacock, the agricultural advisor for the Archers. This is how it ended up on the Archers. He came out and saw our work, um, and that's why they referred to we've been to Gloucestershire and see what they're doing. He was in Gloucestershire seeing what he's doing, and he prizes his bit of PPE. He keeps that as a memo of the day when he was up at 4 o'clock uh, seeing what was going on. That's John Field. If you want to talk to him, he's here as well. Okay. So where do we go next? Well, with the growing expertise, I asked um, 
those people who are doing this work, what they would recommend. And this was some of the field, back, field work. It entirely mirrors what Gavin said. Shadowing people who know more than you do is a great way of building expertise. It's a great way of building capacity within the stakeholder groups, within the organizations that may wish to use um, Badger BCG. Approaching this in a much more holistic way, as uh, in Gloucestershire found, finding the Badger set on the private land adjoining a nature reserve makes a whole lot more difference than trying to find the Badgers that live in the Badger set. Last year, that site wasn't known, including the set gave a much more effective and cheaper uh, delivery of Badger BCG. Cheshire and Shropshire are actually doing, I think, uh, some really important work. They've now started to develop really strong partnerships with uh, private landowners, 1,000 hectares on private sites, as well as their nature reserves. They've acquired funding from the Badger Vaccine Fund, and they've had some really good support from AHVLA, which again is another key partner in this whole delivery exercise to try and make sure that this is taken forward in a much more integrated way than in the past. So this, I see this as stepwise, and what we did in, when, in 2011 was the first step in trying to get something that's going to make a, a difference. And to have the AHVLA sending out letters to landowners has far more clout than it coming from a wildlife organization because of credibility, trust, professionalism. In terms of managing costs, there is a whole body of volunteers who are interested in this work, who feel passionate about badgers, would like to contribute. As Gavin said very well, it's actually scaling up their knowledge too, but they can work alongside lay vaccinators in a very helpful way. When you see the sheer amount of work goes into just setting traps on one nature reserve, that's Greystones Farm, all those red blobs are traps. They all have to be located, that information has to be recorded carefully and fed back to Natural England and is part of the audit process. So this takes the skill side of it, but actually lugging traps around and putting them in hedgerows and doing the grunt side of it is where volunteers can make a really strong contribution and learn how to survey and locate traps themselves. Uh, Brock Vaccination is one of the professional delivery companies and they very kindly um, provided this information about how they go about the process, the bits they do and the bits that are doable by uh, volunteers or learners at the partner end. So not surprisingly, it starts with the client do they have badgers? Do they want to vaccinate them? And then it goes across to Brock Vaccination, who can check whether or not the numbers make sense. They can go to Natural England to get the license, which is a critical step in the whole process. Uh, then some of the on-site work can be done by volunteers. It doesn't require a lay vaccinator present to do that. Then the initiative goes back to the skilled staff, who actually can make sure it's done properly and carry through the actual vaccination process. So they set the traps, make sure that it's all done properly. But there can be support from that, actually by the supporting uh, organizations, by badger groups, by wildlife trust volunteers, whoever, because it actually increases capacity. And then finally, once the vaccination is complete, as Gavin said, cages have to be picked up, all put into one place, collected and taken away. That's quite a substantial exercise as well. These things should not be dismissed as unhelpful. That can save quite a lot of cash and effort. So how much does it cost? Well, we've seen various figures today. Those are the trusting uh, figures in Gloucestershire. I'd go for about £45 a hectare if somebody asked me what would you say at the very small scale. Brock vaccination go at £44 per hectare. That's within the scope of the much larger delivery that has been quoted by FERRA and AHVLA. But that could be reduced, and it could be re reduced a lot, I think, if it was better organized. So where are we? I think we are in an interesting position. We have to remember that this is a problem of cattle and not of badgers, and it can be very distracting when the whole thing becomes about the badger debate. We've seen this morning that there is a lot to be gained from badger vaccination. The science is increasingly encouraging about why this makes sense. But, like poor old Baldrick, badger vaccination gets a really bad write-up, and I don't think it's had the support that would help. 
And there isn't a plan at the moment, and I think that's one of the key gaps in the whole process. It's a serious problem. Um, that's the opening line of the TB strategy for England. The response to that strategy from this group of organisations, uh, this is in the public domain, so I'm quoting it quite happily, total voluntary membership of a million people. They consider, as I do, that a comprehensive strategy for using injectable ba badger vaccination makes every sense. And more importantly, it requires a partnership. And I think the word on there that is critically important at the moment is civil society, because what's happening in Somerset and Gloucestershire at the moment is not making civil society very happy, and some of it's getting a bit uncivil. So I think we really need to take notice of badger vaccination as a contribution that has very wide acceptance. In terms of what do we do, we corporately, we being England, well, four things, I think. I think we need some stronger leadership from DEFRA. It's the place that people look to for what's going to happen in the future. And that could be lots of things. And this is detail, but the, the vaccine fund could be made a little bit friendlier, perhaps. Um, <laughs> We need positive endorsement from leaders. I think that's where a lot of organisations could start talking more positively about badger vaccination and less of the knocking of badger vaccination as useless. And at the moment, the lead is coming from the voluntary side. It's not coming from the industry and it's not coming from government. In terms of planning, we need a canning plan. We need something strategic. Uh, lots of these little efforts are great, but it would make everyone feel better, the farming community and the volunteers, if they knew they were making a real contribution to something that was directed and that had an end point. We need to make sure that the veterinary profession is fully included. The AHVLA and private vets have a really important role to play in this, and I'd like to see them brought in uh, more closely to that. I think the licensing process is a bit slow. If you're in the business commercially, not being sure when you're going to get your license back and being able to start work is a bit of a problem. And I think that's just an operational thing. As this scales up, um, these kind of problems emerge and can be resolved. If it was all handled by one agency, it might be easier. I'm not suggesting which, but at the moment there are several bodies involved in the licensing and control process. Local group working could be much better in terms of how the vaccine's delivered, whether it's at the tiny scale that an impact could be had or whether it's at a larger scale. Uh, knowledge transfer between expert and learning staff, we've spoken about. I think that's a key step forward. And simple stuff, you know, I did a, had the um, figures analysed and we depreciated badger traps in Gloucestershire. Well, they're now being lent to Dorset, which saves the Dorset Wildlife Trust £3,000 in buying their own traps. These are small things, but they make a big difference, and this is all very cost-sensitive. And I think a, a central pool of badger traps might help. There may be a central pool of badger traps that could be used and save cost already. Uh, finally, in reviewing, I think there's lots of information, but by goodness me, it's hard to get hold of. And we need it to flow much more freely, much more upfront, much more open, rather than endless trawling through difficult websites to find out what's happening except that we have an injectable badger vaccine now. The strategy for England talked about oral vaccination of badgers in 2019. Well, you know, if this is the biggest animal health problem there is, why wait four years? Let's get on and use this wretched vaccine instead of talking about it. And today I think it's a great start, um, but something annually would be really good to bring partners together to share information and try and get the momentum. I'd like to thank all those people that provided information to me. I'm very grateful to it. And Chairman, that's the end of my tale.